sufficient for us. His mercy is good. And today we get to come together as a church family and worship that amazing, true, and living God. Y'all ready to do that this morning? Let's do that. Good morning. Let's all stand and join in together with Be Exalted, O God. We have much to praise him for, for his faithfulness and how he sees us through with every circumstance. So let's sing for his glory and honor. started Sunday school back with uh, preschool and up. Uh, also this morning we have a wonderful time of baptism as we have one coming this morning. Kaylee, if you'll come this morning. Kaylee, have you come to that place in your, li in your life when you've asked Jesus Christ to come into your heart to be your Lord and Savior? Yes. Then I baptize you, my sister, in the name of the Father and of the Son, Jesus Christ, and of the Holy Spirit, symbolically buried in sin and raised in newness of life. Amen. Let's continue and uh, let's have a word of prayer and ask the Lord to bless Kaylee and her journey with Christ. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for Kaylee's decision to follow after you, Jesus, and we pray, God, that you would bless her, that you would allow her to grow as a godly woman in your kingdom and in your uh, mission as we, as we see you work in her life. We, may we be the church that will encourage her and help her to grow. Uh, we pray, God, that you would help all of us as we continue to see the day ever approaching of your return to do all that we can uh, within our strength to to see uh, your will done in our lives and in the lives of those around us. There are so many people that are hurting, so many people that are in need. And so, Heavenly Father, we pray that we will continue to share the love of Christ to all that we, that we see and all that we, um, we come in contact with so that uh, you will receive the honor, glory, and praise in all that we say and do. It is in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Amen. I need to take notes. I'm told that I'm a little too vicious when I baptize. It looks somewhat like a choke slam. Um, that was so gentle. Kaylee, that was way gentler than what I would have done. I just try to, try to get the sin out of there, you know what I'm saying? No, I'm just picking. 
But uh, I got a simple question for y'all this morning, and it's just this. How is your prayer life? Genuinely ask yourself. I don't need any shout backs. This isn't a family feud. You know, just keep it to yourself. But ask yourself, how is your prayer life? You know, we, uh, our, our Tuesday night worship meetings with the youth, we recently named that Revive. And so I've been looking at Revival a lot and, and American traditional Revival and what that's been. And we've had services called Revival as churches in the history. But um, one thing that's been a common is if we want to see Revival as a people, right, as God's chosen people, we see Revival through people praying. It always starts there. It always starts there. So this morning in Sunday school, the youth read these verses that I'm about to read to y'all. It says, first of all, then I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for all people, for kings and all who are in high positions, that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. This is good and it is pleasing in the sight of God, our Savior, who desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of truth. For there is one God and there is one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all, which is the testimony given at the proper time. For this I was appointed a preacher and an apostle, and I am telling the truth I am not lying, a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and truth. I desire then that in every place the men should pray, lifting holy hands without anger or quarreling. And that's in the book of 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 through 8. How's your prayer life? Are we, are we praying without ceasing? Are we communicating with God? Because, you know, God opened up a line of communication that we have to Him. We don't have to go through any other mediator. We have our mediator who is Christ Jesus. Are you taking advantage of that? And it says, pray for all people because God desires that all people come to the saving knowledge of him. Know this and let this hurt a little bit because it hurt the first time I heard it. There are people in your life, people who you know, who have never had their name lifted before the throne of God. I hope that stings because it stings me right now even in this moment. I never want to be the reason that someone never had their name lifted before God. Can we pray for our neighbors? Can we pray for our co-workers, for our friends, for our family? Can we pray for them to come to this knowledge of Jesus? Can we pray for the people that are governing us? And can we just pray, God, thank you, thank you, thank you that I'm saved. Thank you that you've rescued me. Thank you that you've paid my debt. Thank you that you've given me the life that you've given me. And no, we know that life's not perfect. We know that it has its hardships. But man, aren't we all blessed so much more than we deserve? So pray for your neighbors and always pray with a heart of gratitude. Today, as we continue to worship, let us just worship God for all the good that he's done. Let, him worship, let us worship him from a thankful heart. Let us worship him because he is good. Please join us now. We're going to continue with song. And the last couple of weeks, we've um, been studying about Joseph on Sunday morning. And um, last week, we learned that Joseph was um, two years that he had to stay in that jail. And so today, we're going to be hearing about the victory over that and how God can change our circumstances in just a moment. All it took was one day and his whole life changed. So we're going to rejoice in that and we're going to be singing Heavenly Sunlight. Now y'all sing out because I don't want to be singing a solo, so join in with me.
Amen. As we have looked through Scripture in the last few Sundays, the theme that I've tried to look through and as I've been preparing sermons was the fact that God has sheltered people throughout the Old Testament and into the New Testament. And as I was going through these different people that God has sheltered, I realized that even though God sheltered them and He protected them, they had to deal with some difficulties. They had to deal with things that were not easy. And so, as we look at the life of Joseph, I started realizing again that, that he went through a whole lot. 
realizing that he, he dealt with difficulty, and, and sometimes he was even forgotten. And last Sunday, uh, we talked about that, that he, he helped the people out even in their time of need in the middle of a prison. And he said, remember me when you go back before Pharaoh, when you get restored to your position. And they said they forgot him. Uh, not last Sunday, but the Sunday before. We had Lord's Supper Sunday last Sunday. Uh, but the Sunday before, we, we find Joseph that he was forgotten, and he was forgotten for two years. That's, that's a hard thing to, to swallow. It seems like it was difficult probably for him to have gone through. The question that, that Christian and I were talking about this morning is, you think that Joseph got a little upset about that? You ever think that he kind of got a little perturbed about that? You think he, he kind of got a little bitter about that? I, I probably think so, you know. I think that he, he kind of had some hard feelings. Because if we start thinking of these biblical people, I won't say just characters, I think that these are real people, we start to put them on a pedestal up there really high, and we forget that they were real people too. I, I think that we, we start giving them superhuman ability to deal with these circumstances, and we make them out to be people that aren't like us, but they were people just like us. Now, we see that they triumph. We see that they come through this, and I think that's where we need to identify with them that we can get through this as well. It doesn't say that he was bitter about this. It doesn't say that he struggled with this, but I think that he probably did. Uh, maybe I'm reading into this, and I apologize if that if that messes with your theology a little bit, maybe if that bothers you a little bit that I, I'm, I'm trying to add to Scripture because I'm really not trying to. I'm really just looking at Scripture saying these people were people and they struggled. You know why? Because we struggle. It should build our faith. It should help us know that we can struggle and still have faith. And we can come out stronger because even in times of sheltering, even in times where we are dealing with life circumstances, God works with us and He helps us to be stronger. But let me tell you, in our struggle and the times when we are defeated, in times when we are distraught, in times when we feel like no one has remembered us, when we feel forgotten, let me tell you, God has not forgotten you. And everything can change in a day. Everything can turn around in a day. Because something happened to Joseph, and his world completely changed in that day. One day can make all the difference. We're going to look at a passage of Scripture. If you will, turn in your copy of God's Word to Genesis chapter 41. Let me give you a little bit of synopsis of what happens. Pharaoh, two years later, after Joseph helps this, this cupbearer, you know what the cupbearer does? He drinks out of the cup of the Pharaoh so that he makes sure that it's not poisoned. Okay, so he's got a pretty risky job anyway. The cupbearer is in the presence of Pharaoh, and Pharaoh has a dream. He has a dream twice, and he's concerned about it. He starts asking his magicians, he starts asking his wise men, what, is these, what do these dreams mean? And he, he can't get anybody to answer him. The dreams are about some cows, some really nice cows. Some of y'all dream about cows. Y'all dream about cows. Some of you farmers dream about cows. That's all you think about. But anyway, these seven cows were nice cows. They were good-looking cows, but all of a sudden these impoverished cows came up and they swallowed up the other cows. It looked like they didn't even eat anything. And all of a sudden he had a second dream and there were these corn stalks, these seven corn stalks, and then all of a sudden these withered ones come along and devour them up and they're gone. I mean, the, the seven corn stalks that were withered just it didn't look like anything happened to them. And so... He says, somebody's got to interpret this for me. The cupbearer says, hey, I know a guy. All of a sudden, he remembers. I remember when I was in prison, and, and the baker and me, we were, you weren't happy with us. I want to forget that. Two years ago, you weren't happy with us. But there's a guy, and he told us our dreams. 
all of a sudden he remembered. Have you ever been somewhere and two years later you remembered what you were thinking of? Uh, some of y'all have. It's going to take two years before you're going to remember what you were thinking about. If you haven't been there, you're going to get there one day. Amen? Some of you older folks remember two years. All of a sudden, he remembers. And so he says, well, let me, let me find this guy. So calls Joseph to himself. They clean Joseph up. <clears throat> Joseph comes before Pharaoh. He says, tell me what this dream, mean, dream means and what this other dream means. Joseph interprets the dream because he says, let me tell you, it's not me that interprets, it's God who interprets. He goes, they're both the same dream. There's going to be seven good years. There's going to be seven bad years of plague. And so what you need to do is you need to find a person who can, who can organize a way to, to save some food, every, you know, a fifth of everything that you have, store it up so that you can survive these seven years of famine. And he goes, you know what? You're a pretty smart guy. And this is where we find the day that everything turned around for Joseph. We find it in Genesis chapter 41, verse 38. Then, jo then Pharaoh said to his servants, can we find a man like this in whom is a divine spirit? So Pharaoh said to Joseph, since God has informed you of all this, there's no one so discerning and wise as you are. You shall be over my house, and according to your command, all my people shall do homage. Only in the throne I will be greater than you. Pharaoh said to Joseph, See, I have set you over all the land of Egypt. And Pharaoh took off his signet ring from his hand and put it on Joseph's hand and clothed him in garments of fine linen and put a gold necklace around his neck. He had him ride in his second chariot, and they proclaimed him before, bowed the knee, and set him over all the land of Egypt. Moreover, Pharaoh said to Joseph, Though I am I'm Pharaoh, yet without your permission, no one shall raise his hand or foot in all the land of Egypt. And Pharaoh named Joseph Zephaneth Paneah, and gave him Asenath, the daughter of Potiphar, priest of On, and his wife, as his wife, and Joseph went forth over the land of Egypt. All of a sudden, Joseph went from being in prison for two years for a crime he didn't commit, and it was over two years, to become second in command underneath Pharaoh in one day. Because God put him in a place and used him in a way that no one else could be used. Can I tell you that God is good? Can I tell you that God is awesome? Can I tell you that God can do something amazing in the matter of just a moment? Can I tell you that no matter what you go through in this life, God is bigger than our circumstances? Can I tell you that God is faithful? Because there's somebody here this morning or someone that's watching that needs to hear that message this morning. There is a, someone who needs to hear that there's a God who brings us hope in the middle of our circumstances. We may not see it immediately, and we may not even realize God is sheltering us in the middle of difficult circumstances, we may feel forgotten. We may feel that there is injustice in our life. We may feel that there are problems around every corner, but know that God is bigger than all of that. He wants the best for your life. He wants amazing things for your life, and they are coming, and they can change in a day. God can change everything in a moment. Joseph, his circumstances changed in a moment. But there are some things that Joseph did in the middle of his circumstances that allowed him to experience the fullness of what God wanted for his life. I'm going to share those with you this morning. First of all, 
something he did and something we should do, is to stand firmly where God places you. Stand firmly where God places you. Do we see the pattern in Joseph's life? And it's not about finding this formula of, of doing the will of God, but look at what Joseph did. Joseph was treated poorly by his brothers. He was sold into slavery, and yet we find him doing his work diligently, and God blessed it. And it said God was with Joseph. He held on tight to that relationship with God. It wasn't fair. It wasn't right. But yet, Joseph did his work diligently. He worked hard for what he did, even though he was in a foreign place when he was betrayed by his brothers, and yet he didn't, he didn't slow down. He didn't stop. He worked hard. He had every right to complain. He had every right to say it wasn't fair. And yet his focus was on, God, what do you want? If I'm going to do this, I need you. And so he stood firmly where, where he placed him. And so then he got, he got lifted up in, in, in uh, Potiphar's house. Then again, he was treated poorly. He was convicted of a crime he didn't commit. He was placed in the jail, and you know what he did again? He worked hard over what he was given. Again, he had every right to complain. He had every right to say, it's not fair. He turned around and he ministered to those two men and interpreted their dreams. That's not easy to do. But he stayed true to what God had done in his life. He, he, he stood firm that no matter what circumstance he was in, he said, you know what? I've got to depend on God. I've got to depend on God. I've got to depend on God, no matter if it was when he was in bad times or whether he was in good times. Because let me tell you, God is going to be there with you whether you're in the, in the valleys or whether you're on the mountaintop. God's faithfulness does not depend on whether we are, are, are got a thousand million dollars in the bank account or whether we have a zero bank account. Whether we've got a position and a title in some company or whether we have no position or title at all. Isn't that great to know that God said that he would be with us just because he's God and he's good? We may not have anything to our name, but God says, you know what? You've got the riches of heaven because I'm in your life. You've got a future and a hope. That's what you've got. You've got Jesus, and that's the most important thing that you've got in this life. So if you've got God, you've got it all. So stand firm where God places you. Then speak fully what God proclaims to you. As Pharaoh approaches Joseph, he says, I want you to tell me what my dreams are. And he says, listen, you've got to understand it's not about me, it's about God. God's going to tell you what, what these dreams are about. Do you realize how dangerous that would have been for a Hebrew to have told a Pharaoh one who believed in many gods, false gods, that, that it's not about your religion, it's not about your way of belief. Let me tell you about the one true God. He's the one who's going to reveal it to you. How dangerous that would have been in that day and time. But it didn't matter to Joseph. He knew where the source of that interpretation was going to come from. Why? Because he knew it was true when he heard the interpretation when he was younger with his brothers. He knew the interpretation of when he was in the prison. 
He had heard the voice of God over and over again, and he knew if he stood before Pharaoh, it wasn't going to be Ra, or it was not going to be some false god, Egyptian god, that was going to give him this interpretation. And he wasn't going to play the game of some political correctness of the Egyptian gods. He was going to say it correctly, that this is the one true living God who's going to give this interpretation. He wasn't going to bow down to the culture of the day and was going to say, well, this is just going to tickle your ear and this is going to be the way that you want to hear it. I'll tell you what you want to hear just to save my neck. No, he said, this is what God said is going to happen. In fact, when he tells Pharaoh this and he tells them that it's happened twice, listen to what he says. He says that when it says it's going to happen twice, This is that that God is going to be the one who has already said that this is the authority of God that's going to happen. If you go back and read in the previous chapter, in in chapter uh, 40, he says that this has already been set by God, that this famine is going to take place. So you better get ready. Saying it isn't the false gods who set time into motion and the will of God what's going to happen in the future, it is God Almighty. And really, if you want to trust something, you better trust God. And so he spoke boldly what God wanted him to speak, not what he thought the Pharaoh needed to hear. There's a world out here today that, number one, needs to hear the truth of God's Word. Amen? There, there, there's a lot of opinions of what, about what life is about today, and yet there's a truth that they need to hear, and that is from God's Word. Secondly, there are people who don't want to hear about God, they don't want to hear about the Bible, and yet that's the very thing that they need. And we as Christians need to unapologetically tell them about Jesus. We need to unapologetically tell them that this is what the Bible says. I mean, we don't have to be rude and obnoxious about it, but speak the truth in love. We're commanded to do this. We don't need to be apologetic about it. It's what we need to do. We've been commanded to do. You know, we, we, we just, we just kind of get timid about it. The Bible says that we have not been given a spirit of fear, but of love and of power and of a sound mind. Why do we have those things? Because we know what God's Word says and that we can trust God in that. We can live without fear. We live in faith. We base our life on the Word of God, and we stand firm on His Word. And if God says it, we have the confidence to say it too. I don't want to offend anybody. Understand something. If someone has a problem with the Word of God, they don't have a problem with you, they have a problem with God. They're not rejecting you, they're rejecting God. You don't have to apologize for something God said. We just have to be responsible to convey what God's Word says in a faithful way. We have to deliver the truth. We have to deliver it verbally. We have to deliver it with our lives. We have to proclaim it in every way possible so that a world that needs God's Word can hear it and see it and experience it. We don't need to give it to the world in a hypocritical way because we will twist and distort God's Word so that people don't understand it. We need to give it in a way that's with integrity we need to give it a way that's clear. We need to give it, a way, give it uh, in a way that is consistent. So we better get in God's Word, know it, and live it out, proclaiming it. Joseph did that. He did not compromise God, God's 
word to him, and he repeated it to Pharaoh just as if it was given to him. And God honored that. Then, he's, we need to serve faithfully when God provides for you. Because Joseph then served faithfully when God provided for him. When all of a sudden, God gave him and put him into a place and position of power, it didn't go to Joseph's head. We're going to see what happens later on when it comes time when he confronts his family because, oh boy, he was in a great position then. Oh boy. Talk about payback. You can't wait. I mean, if you don't know the story, wait till you see how he pays his brothers back. And if you know the story, don't tell those people that don't know yet. We'll let that be a surprise. Let that be a cliffhanger. Just wait till he gets to see his brothers. We're going to cover that. He served faithfully in that position of where God placed him. He could have seen it as an opportunity to make a break for it. All of a sudden, he became second in that country. He could have run. But he knew that if God gave him that understanding of what was about to happen, he actually cared for the people, and he actually knew that God had a purpose and plan for him being where he was. For the people that mistreated him, for the people that he was sold into slavery to, now he was an opportunity to help them. You know, we can go back and look at history. There were people who were sold into slavery like St. Patrick, kidnapped, who later on realized that he needed to go back after he was given freedom and go back to the people and become a missionary so that they could know Jesus. There are people who, who have actually realized that the people that were actually were their captors needed to know Jesus. And doesn't that change your mind about how we need to look at others, your enemy, love your enemy? It's kind of, kind of a strange thought, but God's placed people on people's hearts. You know what? You really need to go back. If you're going to really believe that God wants everyone to be saved, then you better be thinking about everyone, everyone that needs to know Jesus. In all the time that Joseph has experienced, the, the, the excitement, think when he was a young boy, he was excited. One day, you, you, you guys, God has shown this to me. Y'all are going to bow down to me. He was so excited to have these dreams and for God to interpret in these dreams to him to all of a sudden have one knock after another, to have one hit after another, to have one setback after another, to be treated so poorly one time after another, and then all of a sudden in one day, it all turns around. One day can make all the difference. I don't know where you are right now. You may be struggling. You may have felt like God has left you or forgotten you. Or maybe friends or family have forgotten you. But let me tell you that one day can make all the difference because God's not forgotten you. I'm asking that you would persevere, knowing that God is faithful. Just think about people in their lives that have persevered through very difficult times and, and the accomplishments that they have made, maybe not spiritually, but just in, in life. Thomas Edison attempted unsuccessfully 1,000 times to create a light bulb. Imagine that 1,000 and first time and it worked. It all changed at that point. You don't know how much you enjoy electricity and, and light bulbs until you go to a place like Maryville that has no electricity because of a hurricane called Laura. Reminds a lot of people about a hurricane named Katrina. Imagine a, a man by the name of Hank Aaron who went zero for five his first time at bat. 
Imagine if he'd have just given up at that point. Or a man named Walt Disney who was fired by a newspaper editor because he lacked imagination and had no good ideas. He went bankrupt several times before he built Disneyland. In fact, for, the proposal for the park was rejected by the city of Anaheim on the grounds that it would only attract riffraff. A man by the name of Giesel, may, may have been pronouncing that wrong, wrote a book. It's turned down 27 times before the publisher finally gave it a green light called, and to think I saw it on Mulberry Street, better known as Dr. Seuss. Imagine that 27th time or 28th time that he finally got published. A day can make a difference. One day can make a difference. Imagine one day Jesus is coming back. It's going to make all the difference in the world. And all the pains and all the struggles and all the issues in this life are going to fade away. One day. One day, it's going to all be worth it when we see our Savior face to face. When we're no longer going to be sheltered in this place, but we're going to be celebrating forever on high. Let's bow in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, I don't know where everyone is right now this morning, but... There may be a place where someone is feeling frustrated or feeling down, dis distraught, anxious, feeling alone. Lord, I pray, God, that you would renew within their heart, within their spirit, a hope that goes beyond even our own understanding, just a sense of your presence and the power of your Holy Spirit right now whether they're here in the sanctuary or whether they're at home, I pray that you would touch their spirit, that you would allow them to know, God, that you have not left them, you have not forsaken them, that you are right here with us. And that makes all the difference. Knowing that one day, all of this can change. Circumstances, problems, issues, all of it can change because of the power and the presence of Jesus. Remind us, God, that we can hold on. Remind us, God, that we can persist and we can persevere through these difficult times. And in those times of frustration where we need to get very real with you, God, that we can cry out to you, that we can, we can come to you and just say, God, I, I'm just frustrated. I just don't know what's going on. That we can just trust God and fall into your arms because we can't make it another day, knowing that you are right there to catch us. Help us to take our, another step, to help us to get another breath. Renew within us, again, the hope that only you can give. Lord, I pray that if there's a decision this morning that someone needs to make, Lord, I pray that they'll do it. We love you, and we know that you love us. We pray, God, that we will give our hearts and lives over to you once more. So, Lord, we pray that you'll move in a mighty way and that we trust you. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Let's all stand.